All right, I just hit record, so we'll see how we go. <laughs> um, okay. Apparently not very well already. Oh yeah, this is it. This is the secret. This is the secret. I learned it now. Why is that like that? Oh, because of the chat. How do I close the chat? Oh, sheesh. Ah, okay, great. Right, so the secret, Daniel, uh, if you ever do this, I know I'm, I'm telling you, in the unlikely event you ever do this, is to never ever minimize the zoom window. Instead, you need to click on the other windows that are in use or you want to use. Okay. Because as soon as you minimize the zoom window, the cameras are getting messed up like cray cray. All right, so your homework was easy peasy, lemon squeezy. This was your starting. Oh, never mind. I always mess this up. Analysis board. Here we go. And you sent me a marvelous solution, um, which went with king f2, king e7, king e3, king e6, king e4, king d6, king f5, king d7. Sorry, I'm just reading through quick. That is sure. perfect, Daniel. So you you got you caught the idea, a that you needed to put the king in front, and two that this is already a vitally important distant opposition that we needed to head for, right? Yep. Just one thing. I don't see a board yet on my screen. Uh, sorry, I forgot to tell you that this was going to be a blindfold lesson. Um, you disabled <laughs> screen sharing, my friend. Oh, that's right. I have to make you a co-host. Sorry yeah. about that. No, no. I totally forgot, so don't worry. I totally forgot. Okay. Are we good? Yep, we're good. Um, This is the one I... No, this is the one I want to screen share. Yep. Right on. So, okay. distant, distant opposition. Yeah? Yep. Now, on this note, Daniel, we, we recognize that the opposition is one of those very funny tools that is actually the tool of the attacker as well as the defender. And so, on that note, I would like to encourage you to try to come up with a slightly smarter move here for black than king e7. A different move for black, you said? Yep. <clears throat> uh, well, I mean, it could go uh, King D7. I could, but uh, again, let me re-give re you the hint. So the hint is that you as white are hoping to get the opposition. Me as black, I'm hoping for the same. Right. So I want to oppose, obviously, distantly as soon as I can. Oh, oh okay. I got you. So... King f8. Bingo. So what I want you now is to tell me the winning line for white after king f8. Hmm. Because this is the crux of the matter, really. Right. Which is not to say that your provided line was not insightful and really good. It was. And you will find that they are very, very rela uh, closely related. But now I will zip up and you can tell me all the goods. I'm thinking, so, <clears throat> uh, after king f8, king f3, uh -huh. um, and then where black goes next, uh, I mean, if if black went uh, king e7 after that, then you would have king e3, if... Hold on a second, and if I then go king f7? Yeah, that's where it gets a little tricky. So, probably king f Four. Yeah, well, you, that doesn't... You, you know the drill. It, I go back okay. to f6. Okay. Hmm. Then maybe king, king e4. Uh, and then if king e6, then e3. Very good, Daniel. So the whole idea to succeed with this exercise is to realize that you have a pawn move to spare. So even if I do the distant opposition correctly, it does mm -hmm. not matter because in the end, you are going to have a pawn move to spare, which is going to turn the opposition upside down. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Okay. I, I, yep. I credit y Yasser Sirwan's uh, endgame course. I had a, had a drill like that where you explained that, so that's how I know. Very good. Now, I don't know if I asked this question in the homework or not, but I should have. Uh, and that would have been that, what is this position if this is the starting position with white to move? 
Hmm. And from your elongated silence, I take it that I did not ask this question in the homework. No. Um, my my immediate response is that it could could be a draw now. Um, because. But, um, I don't know if we can get opposition anymore. Right. Um, well, yeah. let's let's give it a go because that's the best okay. way. So I want you to calculate the long line where you try your best and black tries their best to deny it. Hmm. Okay. So, okay, so white just moved. Um, maybe king e7. No, no, I want it to be white to move, so I changed the position. Oh, I see. I was looking at it as white had just moved. No, no, moved. I, okay, I, gotcha. alter, I altered <laughs> the position, so now it's the white pawn is on an e3, and so again, you to move to make it uh, more, you know, white friendly or try to figure out what's going on from white's point of view. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so white to move. Um, let's see. King e2. Um, king e7. King e3. Uh, did you say king e3? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. King d3. Yep. My apologies. No, no. All g. Two. King e7. King d3. Um. Hmm. Just trying to figure out whether black moves forward uh, while moving to the side. Um, I'll try. I'll try. King d6. Yep. And then. King e4 and then King e6 and black has opposition. Okay, so hold on a yeah. So your line went King he, King here, King here, and then King here. Yes. And then after that, King e4, King e6. Okay, we made two blunders in that line, Daniel. One for white, one for black. Okay. Let's see. Remember, Daniel, that the alpha and the omega, the beginning, the end, the whole entire story is about opposition. And you failed twice, once with black, once with white, to actually get it. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing where I failed at that. Um, okay, so when I played King He, Daniel, did you oppose with black? I thought so by going King uh, King D6. But that begs the question, Daniel, of how do we define opposition? <clears throat> um, well, okay, so... What is the definition of opposition in terms of King and Pawn endings? If you have opposition, then your opponent's king um, has to uh, has to be the one to like move away from from the up, up, up from your king. Um, okay, so uh, we need to clean this up, Daniel, because uh, the yeah. reason why you're getting this wrong is because you have the wrong idea of opposition. The key factor, Daniel, in opposition, which, by the way, would have made your life harder already here to find this move, is, is that the kings must be standing on the same colored squares. Hmm. Okay. The, this, because by the logic you told me, this would be just as well opposition as that. Yeah, right. Yeah, like there was no rigid rule and logic uh, adjusted to it or attached <laughs> to it. So there are two ways to explain it. One, which is the easier one, is same colored squares. The slightly more complicated but, but more mathematical or scientific one is odd number of squares between the kings, which in this case is five. In okay. The, uh, yeah. If I move up, it's three. And the last type of opposition is when it's one. Okay. <coughs> so what we did wrong... Here was was that um, 
king e7, king e2. So first thing to do here is to actually stay on the e-file, sort of staying neutral, so that depending on where I move with the king, you can adjust your movement to match the color of the square I'm moving to. Ah. So when I played okay. king d3 and you went king d6, that's no opposition, friend. And now this allows me to move into opposition, which was your white blunder, mm. by the way, because you went to e4. I see. Right? Okay. So that is your opposition there. And as a result of that, of course, after king d3, the correct defensive measure is king d5. Yeah. Note that yep. king d7 here uh, is also a distant opposition, but you don't want to go that way. This way it's still sufficient, but once you allow the king in front of the pawn, you need to be extremely careful to, do that, to not to allow the spare move with the pawn. So it's far safer to just keep the king at bay with king d5, keeping the immediate uh, opposition and its happy days. And uh, the evaluation is correct, by the way. This is a draw. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, can you remind me? Uh, did I give you two? I uh, gave me four. Oh, my <laughs> God. You have a mini chess coach. Okay. <laughs> um, Ready. Oh, can you send me, please, all the free other FENs? Yep. I can do that right now. Thank you. It's going to mess a little bit with the recording, but that's fine. Okay, that's the second one. Third. Oh, okay, this was an easy one. And then fourth. Says coach. Okay, um, is the solution on the same document you sent? Yes, it yeah, is. Yeah, I have the solutions for all of them. Yeah, yep. very good. So this was a very basic pawn break through with HC, uh, f6 takes, g6 takes, and push. And that is a yeah. solution, and that is correct. I hope you did notice that taking on g6 is a mistake, because after king e6, the pawn is in the square of the pawn. Um, let's see. Can you start that over again? I was just closing out the, uh, F, the FEN chat window there. Uh, what was the mistake? Oh, sorry. So what I was saying was that you realized correctly that taking here is no go. And instead oh, right. pushing is go because now the pawn, the square of the pawn, which by the way, I recall that you tweeted about this week, having yep. missed it, uh, yeah. is here. Right. Yep. Yeah. Now, the square of the pawn is... It usually becomes uh, of second nature very soon for a player once they learn it because the idea is that as many squares on the front is as many squares on the side. And that right. gives you two sides of the square and it's reasonably easy to complete. The only time, in my opinion, when the square theory is a little bit messy is when the pawn is on its starting square. Mm. Because then I can move two forward and that shrinks the square dramatically. And so once you are doing a race against a pawn on the starting square with a king very far away, I'd rather rely on calculation than trying to figure out where the squares are because, as I said, it shifts when the, move, when the pawn moves two squares ahead. Okay, that was easy yeah. peasy. Um, second, or rather third, excuse me, is this. Oh, this was very mean, Daniel. This was very mean. <laughs> this that was, one was hard. This was one of my favorites, and this is a really meany one. Okay, so this is, by the way, one of the things that uh, I have a very long been a huge advocate of. And now having read Ramesh's book that I showed you, he actually echoes my sentiment in this. And that is that one of the best ways to improve your calculation skills is to try to force the heck out of yourself to find the best moves for both sides. So your line, which I'm very proud of, by the way, goes with, oh, the FN is wrong because it's white to move. Does it change it if I replace this W with a B? Is that how FENs work? Let's try that. Haha! -ha! Great. Scientific <laughs> discovery, friend. Um, okay, so after... Actually, no, I'm not going to play that. So your line goes A takes B3, King B2, King C4, King A3, King C3, stalemate. You followed me? Yeah. You must yep. have been very yep. proud of yourself for finding that. Oh, because um, it's a unique stalemate. It's not an everyday motif. It's quite special. 
Right, yeah. I mean, it's definitely not unique, but I, once I saw it, I was just like, wait a minute, that's that's a draw right there. Now, I am proud um, of you for finding that, so if you don't take credit, I will give you some. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, that's not the end of the story, Daniel, because that's where the good old golden rule of is that the best for black question comes in. So mm. calculate that line all the way to king a3, and let's see if black can do something better than uh, king c3. Okay. Is it possible to uh, flip the board just because I was used to looking at this from, you know, since it's black to move? Be my guess. Okay. So let's see. You said other than king a3, a better move. No, 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 right? no, no. King a3 is correct. We are improving this for black. Okay. So then you played king c3. I'm asking if you have a better move than king c3. I see. Yeah, I think I had a second variation where I. I tried king d3. I need an even better move than that. I'm looking at it right now. Okay. Yeah, that one ended up as a draw as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. Well, it's only so many options. <laughs> Let's see. So we know now that King c3, king d3. Um, so it looks like we have either king d5 or king d4. Is the king Daniel the only king piece that we can move? Oh, yeah, you're right. Wait, what is the a takes king b2? That's true. Okay, so yeah, we do have B2. Okay, so I want you to calculate that. Actually, okay. out loud, if I may ask. Okay. So, B2, King A2. Tell me, please, what happens if we take? You mean, like, after... B2, King after... takes B2. Okay. Well, I mean, that seems more logical at first sight, right? I'm not saying it's, yeah. be I'm not saying it's better, but uh, let's, um, yeah, do the, let's go there first. Okay. So king takes b2 and then king takes b4. Um, which means we have the opposition. Correct. So I want uh, you, Daniel, yeah. to accomplish a level of confidence where after king b4... You look at maybe an angry face and you go like, dude, it's over. Right. Yeah, this was actually a similar position to one of the other it's ones you It's gave. exactly yeah. that. Yeah. Except it's yeah. those colors. And you have right. the opposition. And uh, until you are not 100% certain that this is a straightforward win, you need mm -hmm. to continuously uh, you need to continue working on these basic pawn endings because this okay. is non negotiable. Like this is a position that any chess player should recognize instantly. Look at it, go throw. Let's move on. See ya next. I mean, obviously with um, black to move that is because if it's white to move, then of course black wins because of the opposition has to be given up, right? So either case, you look at it, you go like, yeah, white to move loses, black to move draw next. Yeah, okay. and that level of yep. proficiency needs to be there. Because okay. everything or a lot of end games are based on, you know, these basic knowledges that you stir the game towards this because you know that this is this. Right, now, here comes your genius idea. What if after B2, we don't take as per proposed, but instead we play King A2? Okay, so King A2... Can black still win? Let's see. So after king a2, I'd probably try uh, uh, king c3. Yeah, very good. But then white would maybe go king b1. Yep. When you said maybe only well not only legal move king a3 is also possible but let's let's not go there for the time being <laughs> right <laughs> yeah king b1 very good go okay on. um probably 
probably king b3. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. That that that's a draw. Um Yep, so that's a stalemate, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So let's take instead this, yeah? Yeah, right. So king takes b4 and then king takes b2. And 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 then so white has the opposition. So I believe it's a draw from you there. You believe or you're 100% right? convinced <laughs> that you would be willing to bet your house and your car and your life insurance on it? <laughs> the stakes are too high now. <laughs> <laughs> well, the stakes don't change the facts, right? Right. Yeah, I know. I know it should, I should be that confident, but I'm... Uh, I but it could we, be we a just, trick. <laughs> we, I know. We, we just said that. It was just the same position we just talked about. That exactly. If, if, yes. if white has the opposition, then, yeah. then it's, a, it's a draw. Yeah. So this is, Daniel, the ultimate example of trying to find the best move for both sides. Because the line you provided is correct. This is a draw. But this doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we exhausted the possibilities in the position and we understand the mechanisms that are at place here uh, entirely. So I wouldn't say that we scratched the surface, it's deeper than that, but we definitely haven't uncovered everything. And sometimes this can change the results. So it's very important to see this uh, resource. And in fact, this was the resource why Black entered this game uh, position in the first place. Because the mm -hmm. original position in this endgame was that this white pawn was here there's a black queen here, and there was a white rook on b4. Okay. And black was thinking to himself that, okay, I don't want to bother with figuring out how to win queen versus rook when this liquidation into a pawn ending after take king b2, king c4, king here, b2, king b2, king six, b4, at least the winning king and pawn ending. But what he overlooked was the fact that after b2, king a2, double x clam, and uh, c, yeah, that's mm. a draw. So um, that is why it is very important that we try to all the time, every time, um, oopsies, that's the wrong button, uh, figure out what is going on. All right, next, um, oh, that was number three, yeah? And I gave you only four. Yep, that's right. Yeah. On only, says coach, <laughs> only. Daniel goes like, yeah, I need 16 days in a week for this. Ah, <laughs> uh, this is something that I torture my students all the time with. This is uh, a remarkably nasty example for how easy it appears to be. Okay, so your solution, Daniel, goes with white to move. Uh, and I'm going to play it out for you now. Actually, no, I'm not, because I'm notoriously nasty. But I will help you a bit by the arrows. So it goes king c7, king a8, king b6. King b8, mm -hmm. king a6, back to a8. Yep. And you end that line on a draw. Uh, let's see. Does that sound right to you based on what we discussed today? So... I'm happy to repeat the solution for you. That yeah, if you could course. repeat what I what I wrote. Yeah, I you went I, you went king c7, king a8, king b6, king b8, king a6, king a8, uh, b5, king b8, king b6, draw. Right. No, sorry, I stand corrected. In the end, you went b5, king b8, b6, king a8, draw. Okay. Now, there are a fair think. number of blunders in that line. So let's try to clean this up now together based on our newly founded knowledge of opposition. Okay. So, so let, let, I actually want you to start from scratch. Ignore what you have done. And just let's let's restart this from, from scratch with your far more confident and uh, bolstered <laughs> knowledge of opposition. So king c7, black goes king a8. I want you to calculate this line up for me, please. Okay. And again, out loud, if I may request. Yeah. King c7, king e8. Um, and then I think I had... Oh, well, I, I don't want you to was... worry about what you had, Daniel. Well, let's let's start afresh. Start, okay. Because it's going to actually hinder your thinking more so than support it. Okay. Uh, king b6 after that. Yep. Um and then king b8 yeah still makes sense to me yeah 
Hmm. I'm just double checking that I still want to make the move that I originally thought. I mean, which is why I told you to forget about your original because, like I said, it's just going to keep on making you second guess yourself. Okay. Well, let's see. Have... And is there any reason why we wouldn't want to take this pawn? Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's what I was thinking. I mean, that was the original. <laughs> so I was yeah. just wondering if that was still right. <laughs> yeah, king takes a6. Um, yeah, I assume still... Well, is black's best move king a8. Yep, what do we do then, Daniel? Um, B5. Have you reached the position where Daniel goes like, this is blah, otherwise you can take my house, car, and my social security insurance? Or not yet? I have not yet, no. Okay, that's so, a problem. Because what we achieved here, Daniel, is exactly what was the position in your homework one. That this is our position, why to move, but with a poor move to spare, back is now bust. It's over here, man. Okay. It's over here. You copy the opposition and then you choose. This is actually the position that you want to get into with black to move because whichever way black goes, you go the other way and the pawn is unstoppable. So yeah. kinky, kinky, bang, 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 queen. And kinky, kinky, bang, 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 queen. Okay. You, you know, you want to spend Daniel some time on this because, like I said, it's absolutely imperative that you have no question marks or even a shadow of a doubt in yourself about correctly evaluating these basic king and pawn endings because all of them are based on your knowledge of knowing what these positions are like with white to move or black to move yeah i think i still have a little trouble seeing it as clearly as it is when it's right in front of me there on the board uh, as when i'm visualizing it to that position so if we have whatever it is, four or five moves to get there. <clears throat> I, I don't see it as clearly in my mind yet. Like yeah. when you put it up there, I was like, oh yeah, that obviously. <laughs> yeah, but that picture well, wasn't as clear yet and for me. And see, the, again, the thing is that the best way to practice that is to do what we're doing now because how else will you get better at memorizing, sorry, so visualizing pawn endings other than practicing right. pawn endings. Matter of fact, these are one of the best vehicles for visualizing full stop because they give you a mini version of chess. It's only three pieces. Mm -hmm. When you play a game, you need to keep in mind 18, 20, 24 of them, 32, God forbid, depending on what you are playing. So, um, yeah, this is perfect for that. Um, by the way, just one more little hint that what you also need to keep in mind is that the evaluation of this position is vastly different from when the pawn is one square up. Yeah, because then when okay. the king goes to b8, I cannot follow the opposition because my pawn is obstructing the view. Yeah. And that's why that's a draw. But with the pawn here, this is a win. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. So keep that in mind. Now, um, what... Um, okay, so we now explored one of the most important concepts of opposition. However, we are not even an inch closer to the truth as far as the outcome of this position is concerned. Because once we now put this uh, opposition thing... Uh, or we fix this properly, now we still need to go back to my main mania, which is the best move for both sides. And by the way, this example is extremely nasty because almost all the way, black only has two legal moves. Hmm. And yet most people, when solving this, exclusively focus on one black defense and they never look at both. So let me show you why that's important. Let's start again with white to move from the starting position. Please call out your lines and let's focus on the black moves. Okay. So that was king c7. Right? What is black's move? Let's see. Last time we did, I think, a king a8. That's but... right. So you immediately go into, although we don't know why yet, but I'm going to show it to you. You immediately go like, is, black, is that black's best? And right. since there is okay. only one other legal move, it's not like we have to, you know, explore an abundance of <laughs> variations. It's going to be two at every single step of the way. So it's super easy. Yeah, I, I was too quick to judge. So after King C7, I thought, well, if if black plays A5, then B takes A5. And 
Um, I was like, he's just giving up a pawn. But, I, you know, again, the analysis doesn't stop there, right? So Actually, no, so... it does, Daniel, because your pawn landing knowledge tells you that a side pawn can't win. So it's an instant draw. Thank you. Game over. Mm. Okay. Which is why also you see now how extremely harmful it is to really rigidly in, uh, insisting on hanging on to material. Yeah. Because yep. if, <laughs> if I actually took it, which is a horrid blunder, uh, then it's an instant draw. But all of a sudden you realize how valuable this source is. Because at mm -hmm. no point can white take this. So is a5 a draw? Um, so after a5, I'll, I'll show you, share with you my thought process and tell me if I'm doing it wrong. I will. <laughs> Okay, so after a5, my instinct is to uh, calculate the pawn race and say, okay, well, white has four squares to queen. Um, you know, Daniel, where, what I'm going to do before you even finish the sentence, right? Right, that's probably why I even hesitated to yeah. do it that way. But... I, please tell me no one taught you this. Like, this is a self-developed bad habit. <laughs> I... No one taught me that, yeah. No, thank God, okay. <laughs> right, yeah. Bzz, no, moves. Moves and lines, please. And uh, you are on move one, Daniel. It's going to hit you so hard. Why what you were about to do is so bad. Ah. Uh, okay. So, yeah, it it uh, already happened. Yeah. <laughs> so after a five, uh, b five, a four, a six check. Uh, b six. I'm sorry. B six check. Yes. Ta da. Check. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it became immensely relevant how many moves it took for the respective pawns because ours is an ex had a booster right yeah right yep and on top of that daniel even in the end even if even if uh, you know that didn't happen and the king somehow ended up here when we promoted to queen and they did too we would have a check to pick off the queen right not that yep. that was going to happen because we are going to make them way before they queen but uh so the conclusion is that a5 b5 wins for white Right. Right? Yep. Now, yep. having said that, you now feel that you are armed with a new defensive tool. And that tool is, mm. is that at any given point, you are good to throw this pawn at me. With black. Okay. And remember, you are whenever I'm giving you this, and in fact, even in real games, you are not white or black. You are the seeker of truth. So your objective is not to win or lose. Your objective is to figure out what the position is. And this is why I prefer to not to give why to move and win or why to move and draw. No, why to move? Tell me what's going on. Like, no one is going to give you any pointers in chess either. So why would I prepare you for a full scenario? So, King C, King C8, King A8. So far we have established the two, sorry, the best moves for both, si both sides. King B6. To me, it seems extremely logical. Yeah? Yep. Now, we have covered king b8. Is that black's only move? No, it could play a5. Please treat me. Eva lines, okay. evaluations, please. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so we said from here, king c7, king a8, king b6... Um, and then a five. So, okay. Um, I'll try B four, five. I'm sorry. Yes. B five. I, I love Daniel. You're thinking genius at work. I really hate myself for interfering here and interrupting your thinking. But can you please just very quickly eliminate for me the two captures? Okay. Um, Simply because they are simpler. The line you okay. were about to engage with with B5 is the most complicated to calculate. So let's start with uh, King takes A5. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Um, let's see, the king is on, uh, black king is on a8, so king takes a5, um, 
and perhaps uh, I'm trying to figure out where, what Black's best move is from there. Um, maybe King A7. Maybe. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure yet. I haven't calculated. Uh, but I can try. Like it's not immediately obvious to me which of the three king moves is best for black. What is the driving force behind your choice, Daniel? Um, opposition. Okay, so how come it's not obvious to you which one to go for? Um, because king a7 is the only move that opposes, right? Right. I guess sometimes I don't always know whether op the move that gives aside opposition is always the best. Like, I don't know, maybe there's a trick or something else that's better. The only thing, Daniel, that you need to keep in mind is something that we have already exhausted in our discussion, and that is is that the, the attacking side has a spare pawn move somewhere that turns this things up, thing upside down. Right. I right. do not have a spare move because that denies my king from keeping the opposition. Okay. So let's okay. let's clear this up for once and all, yeah? You go king a7, mm -hmm. instant draw. House, car, social insurance, you name it. King b7, 7,000 question marks. King b5, white has gained the opposition, black loses. Done. Yeah. Queen. King b8, right. 7,000 question marks. King b6, opposition. Actually, mm. this position wins with either color to move because white already has a spare move, game over. I see. Okay. And last but not least, King A7 grabs the opposition, grabs the opposition, grabs the opposition, and now white can't oppose. Pawn up back here so that you grab the opposition, and it's a draw. Right. Yeah? Yep. Okay. So the conclusion, Daniel, is, is that A5 uh, in this position is looking more and more like a genius of a move, but sorry, I'm cheating because I played it out, because King takes A5 is firmly met by King A7 instant draw. What happens with pawn takes? Um, um, sorry, I have to like reset my brain the uh, the line. So, king c seven. Yep, king that's a, fine. King king a eight. Mm -hmm. King b six. Mm -hmm. A five. Mm -hmm. And now we're evaluating uh, b takes a five. Correct. Is that right? Yep. Pawn, okay. Pawn takes pawn. Okay. Hmm. Um. So black only has one move for opposition there. Yeah. Which, Daniel, remind me quickly it, again. Where is the white pawn? On a five. And that tells you what? Is that a side um, pawn, Daniel? Yes. Can side, side pawns ever win a pawn ending? Uh, no, not based on what we said earlier. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. I think you have got a young man a little bit more homework to do with uh, 100 endgames you must know. Daniel, side pawns can't win. Okay. Ever. Okay. So as, as long as my king is controlling one of these two squares underneath, it's a draw no matter what. Okay. Like, th this is just one of those things, again, that you absolutely must know at any given time you are walking up in your nicest dream side pawn pff, no draw see ya that's it so okay. that immediately eliminates by the way you calculating this if you are looking for a win for white like you don't even look at that because that's a draw okay yep. the same way how you wouldn't analyze king c5 because of two kings like you don't start analyzing this right <laughs> right now this is the exact same like no difference whatsoever you don't look at this it's a draw okay it's just that's it not winnable, see, yeah. And that exactly is the idea and the concept that takes us to king c7, king a8, king b6, a5, b5. And there comes okay. the calculation, but I'm going to make that your next homework, Daniel, because I wanted to spend some time on the games that you played, and we are massively headed for an entire lesson spent on pawn endings, which, by the way, <laughs> turned out to be vitally important because right. we need to definitely um, patch up those gaps um, yeah. in, in your knowledge. And once again, I would like to refer to 100 Endgames. Got it. That, that, is, my list. that is your yep. Bible. If you haven't done it, 
Um, that's and I'm not I'm not telling you that because I'm too lazy to tell you the rest. But I believe that that's your time and you know everything better spent uh, sure, if you do sure. that yourself because that is a very easy stuff that you can easily easily acquire as knowledge from that book. Now, okay. uh, I have opened up that link somewhere here. Okay, so these are your games. Oh no, that was the only thing I didn't want to do. Um, this is what I want to do. Okay, so these were games you played uh, online? Online, yeah, in the past week, yep. Okay, are we white or black here? Um, black is Mr. Lona. Right, okay, we are black. Oh, well, on to the Shevening and like a champion, eh? Yeah, right. Love, love and life, senor. Love and life. Goody. As, okay. is, as is typical, they don't give me like a traditional open Sicilian. But no, okay. I would tell you, Daniel, that uh, on the rating level you are currently, uh, I would say that about eight games out of ten are not going to feature the open Sicilian. Yeah. Hate to tell you that. That's okay. Hate to tell you that. Um... Look, in this position, I probably would have preferred uh, Night Blocks. Mm. Simply because I have an inkling that this guy is going to give this up. And I'm happy for that to happen, either case. Especially on D7, because if you go to Knight C6, E5, take, take, Knight takes, may force an ugly pawn structure where we have got double isolated pawns. And that's a bit iffy. But going yeah. to D7 here is almost certainly going to result in your opponent either taking this, giving you two bishops, or completely wasting a tempo on coming here. Like, if mm -hmm. they go back, a6 is super useful for your expansion on the queen side with b5 and putting the bishop on the long diagonal. But yeah. that's, that's fine too, like, it is totally okay. Take, take. Okay, so this is important, Daniel, that we want to eliminate the knight db5 idea, which very awkwardly hits this pawn. Now, I don't think that in mm. this position is a problem because you get to play queen b8 and after bishop f4 you get to play knight e5. And that successfully patches this up and you will uh, kick the knight up with a6 next move. But as a general concept, whenever you have a bishop on d7 in these Shevening and setups without playing a6 first, you always really have to watch out for a possible knight db5 idea to hit um, d6. Okay. Because your opponent played a fair few doozies, uh, bad moves, right. it is now not a relevant motif, but you need to be aware. Oh my lord. <laughs> right. Okay, so let's talk about d5 break in the Sicilian. It usually is very good. In fact, in this position, I don't really mind it, but I would be reluctant to transition into an IQP from here where white has got a very firm blockade on that pawn. So, generally speaking, um, you, what you want to do when you break with d5 is to be able to take back on d5 with pieces. Um, okay. Right? Uh, which is pretty difficult to accomplish, by the way, with the bishop on d7, for which reason a very common shevening and motif is to trade on d4 and upgrade this bishop onto a long diagonal beast. Yeah, I realized later that's what I should have done. Which still, by the way, makes d5 break difficult because you then have to watch for e5 which is also unwanted. So if I were black in this position, I would play e5, let's say they do a doozy, e5, queen goes away, whatever, and then, actually I will put the queen here to defend this, and then d5. Okay. And now that was a beautiful natural progression in the center where you advanced both of your pawns, and even after offering the trade, your structure is not getting compromised. Right. Yeah, now as for actual moves and what I would play here for black, I don't know, A4, A6, B5 still appeals to me. Especially because I wanted to eliminate this option. But maybe the immediate knight D4, bishop C6 is, is quite good too. Yeah, okay. okay. So D5, bishop F3, wow, okay. I did not see that coming. But maybe, yeah. So naturally, you would want to hit this with knight E5 because we like knight for bishop. But E D5... It's quite a pesky variation here because now this is guarded by a few too many dudes. Mm -hmm. So this may or may not be playable. 
I mean, there is a mass of trades to do here with knight d4, queen d4, take on e4, take on e4, uh, sorry, knight takes, pawn takes, and then bishop f6 hitting the queen on d4 gets you a delicious tempo. What did you do? You took, you took, you went to d5. Yeah, this bishop is a bit of a, a problem piece. So, for example, he, Daniel, a very natural way to improve your pieces would be to take on here and again put this bishop here. Okay, yeah. It's a very common issue in the Scheveningen when you put your bishop on d7, which, by the way, is very rare and suboptimal. Uh, these two guys are very silly. They don't like each other. <laughs> yeah. okay, like they really, uh, really don't get on too well. And the most common Scheveningen solution to this problem is, is that you trade on into this knight and then you replace it with the bishop and upgrade it into a boss. Yeah, I, I realized that after the game in my analysis, I had this, I don't know, just this limited thinking or something where I didn't want to uh, exchange the knights just to help develop his queen in the center. Well, actually, see, uh, this is the thing that now it's more than likely that they will take you here, which in turn turns out that they developed your rook. Ah, uh, yeah. And the queen actually true. just moved twice only to be traded off. And by the way, uh, a lot of people would go like, oh yeah, but isolated pawn. No, this is not. So this would be bad if it was in an open file. The reality is, is that this endgame position is already far superior for black because you're dominating the open file. And more importantly, you're dominating the diagonal, which means that these two can't come out. Mm, I see. And none of these pawns are targetable weaknesses. On paper, they are bad because they are split. But in reality, right. the position itself as a whole is far better for black because the pieces, the way how the pieces operate is outweighing the importance of uh, the inconvenience of the split pawns, which neither of them are attackable, especially if you put it on white. Anyway, back to game. So yeah, knight d5 I don't like. It also is, by the way, immediately kickable with c4. So in fact, I would label this as a pretty poor choice here because what are we doing after c4? Yeah, I was trying to get my dark square bishop to the uh, e6 square. You to mean have it do... to d6? I'm sorry, the f6, f6, f6 square to have it just be more active on that diagonal. Okay. I, I didn't feel like it was doing much on that. Now, hold your thoughts. Because what you're telling me and what you're doing on the board contradict each other. Okay. Because what you're telling me is that you want to put this bishop on f6. I don't see how this move accomplishes that because you never ever want to allow a trade for knight for bishop in these positions. Right. So bishop yeah. f6 is unspeakable here. Hold it. If you want to play bishop f6, why don't we take and play bishop f6? Yeah, now I'm, I'm questioning whether that was, because I would I would have definitely have seen that. I don't know, maybe I'm trying to re remember what my thinking was. Um, why I played, was it, it was knight, uh, knight d5. Um, yeah. That's, yeah, my biggest not... problem, Daniel, with knight d5 is that it seems to me that we didn't really reckon with any white responses here because after c4, you very clearly don't have an adequate response. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Like everything Whatever. just looks bad. And so when you play, when you decided to play knight d5, we did not have the classical, what is my opponent's most likely response to that type of question? Yeah. Okay. Um, certainly not that. <laughs> yeah, that surprised me. No wonder. Um, yeah, uh, speaking of bishop f6, it looks right. like a great move. Or take, take bishop f6, grabbing a very delicious tempo on that queen. Looks great. Right. Knight e5 looks great. Very great. Uh, actually, yeah, even that looks great. But I would have played take bishop f6 here for sure. Um, okay, okay, okay. Yep, yep, that's good. I don't mind this move. I like it, actually. The alternative was bishop c5. I'm trying to figure out which way I would go if I were black. But I'm going to roll with bishop f6. It's very logical. c3 is also very logical, which was part of the reason, by the way, why I wanted to go to here. Because I wanted to pursue some kingside agenda. And obviously, mm -hmm. in terms of the IQP, they, these two moves do the same. Yeah, They control the square in front of the uh, the pawn. And I would expect right. black to play c3 in either case. And then I wanted to develop my queen here, which already threatens with bishop h3. Anticipating knight d4. And then it's probably something like queen g6. 
Mm-hmm. But all I'm saying is that I find it a little bit more natural with an IQP to play on the king's side, and that's a more common tendency anyway, than to play on the queen's side, which is now where your bishops are directed at. Yeah. So, yeah, I, yeah. I had trouble figuring out a plan here mm -hmm. of, of what was best because I had to keep an eye on that pawn and I felt that tied me down a lot. Yep, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, this is going to be harder for you to find a productive plan with bishops pointing this way than the other way. Uh, I like rook d8. Having said that, did we have here a very sexy knight a5? Just to contradict immediately what I just said about finding a plan. <laughs> Um, I think I was eyeing that even there. Um, I'm not, I don't remember why I chose uh, rook c d8 before knight a5, but knight a5 was already on my mind here. Okay, well, if it was, I'm very curious to know why you didn't do it, because to me it seems like it's almost winning on the spot. Like, I'm actually really? struggling. To, well, I'm, I'm struggling to find a white move. Mm-hmm. Like what does white actually do to stop the dual threat of knight b3 and knight c4? I mean, if you do toss up Daniel between these two, there are two things that I'm he sort of would like to push you towards. One, this carries a lot of oomph and threat. This this has got pressure, aggression, intention written all over it. This is prettying up your position and allows your opponent a lot of choices, in particular knight d4, which is, by the way, what they want to do anyway, right? Now, I'm not saying that this is a bad move, but what I am saying is, is that with this, you are giving your opponent A, an easy move, B, which is A1, or 2, is an easy move that they wanted to do anyway, and 2, we are not putting on pressure. Yeah. Whereas this... Causes a lot of headache, man. Like, how are they, I honestly don't see how they stop the dual threat. Because knight c4 wins a pawn. Right. By virtue of double attack, yeah? So, right. I'm looking at queen moves only. And I looked at queen c2, but now we have d4. And as it turns out, you didn't need a rook on d8 to break with the IQP because this line wins a piece. <laughs> So, yeah. the good old lines are the, your best friends in terms of, uh, you know, deciding these situations. But as soon as you see these two squares here and the knight move that covers both, oh boy, that's a party and a half. Yeah. I don't know, maybe queen d3, but then again, this ha nah, this is not playable. Nah. Yeah, so rook and knight a5 was your way to go. Um, okay. Bishop e3... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you see the vast difference, Daniel, that now we are not even threatening to go in there. Right. So yep. this now has become an absolutely one-dimensional idea. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but in comparison, nowhere near as effective as it uh, could have been. Right. And yep. that what's happening on the board now, Daniel, is what we are really dreading in general in IQPs, and that is that pieces are coming off. Yeah, pieces are getting traded here, pieces are getting traded here, and it feels like we are rather helpless against that too. Yep. Okay, that was good. I love this rerouting, by the way, to E4. That was awesome, man. Very... Yeah, I didn't think it was doing anything on, on C4 anymore. No, no, this was great. You need to plug up the E file, and uh, yeah, you, that this was just good, good stuff. I like it. I like it. I like that too. That was low on time. <laughs> that oh, was just, look, uh, yeah, that, I, I had like a minute and a half on my clock here, so. You yeah. Look, as you know, I'm not a big fan of these moves, but uh, this is typically a position where even with half an hour on the clock, it's not so easy to come up with an idea. Naturally, I'm very attracted to G5 here. Oh, yeah, I don't think that was on my radar. But, um,. I do not know the value of this move in light of some knight d2 trading shenanigans. Okay. Because there is not an awful lot of point in me flexing my muscles on the king's side if knight d2 just trades everything off. Yeah. Yep. Actually, there still is some point in flexing those muscles, but not as much as I would have liked it to be. 
Yeah, and that's exactly where this game was uh, headed. Mm -hmm. Now we should hold this without too many dramas, but uh, you had a better idea and you ended up winning it. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, he made that move like in, I don't know, 10 oh seconds. Oh boy. <laughs> that king move was made in about 10 seconds, I think. That's kudos to the opponent for walking into the most spectacular mate I could have possibly imagined from this game. Now, dude, this was this was a really solid game in the sense that um, no major blunders whatsoever. And if you look at the game as a whole, it sort of had a consistent flow to it. I think that's a good way to describe it. It had lots of inaccuracies and misses and whatnot. But if you look at it as a as a whole, mm -hmm. it sort of made sense. Say, barring for the mating one that your opponent walked into. But it had a very natural flow to it. And frankly, I think that uh, a, a draw outcome here would have been quite fair. Mm -hmm. And right. uh, like I said, the overall impression of this game was quite positive. Now, it's a pity that uh, we are out treating our opponent here by more than 100. Because actually, he showed, apart from the very end, a pretty decent grasp of what was going on there. Yeah, I think it's what frustrated me is that uh, I saw some of those. You you even cut, like kind of reacted to those missteps that he made in the opening. Is like moved the bishop back all the way, moved it twice, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the bunny ears, and I, and I wasn't able to punish it, and that that frustrated me. Mm, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. I mean th those subtleties, you you need to get get better at uh, you know those uh, reflexes in that early middle game or late opening to improve those bishops because we both missed this idea with the, uh, improving that bishop and you also missed this idea on multiple occasions to improve uh, the effectiveness of your pieces. Okay, mm -hmm. let's have a look at this very quickly. I'm probably holding you up for too long. No, that's fine. I don't even remember my own theory here, Daniel. <laughs> uh, I was in book, on, let's see, uh, this was all book for me, let's say I played, let's see, yeah, white to move, so knight g5. Yeah, it looks good. This looks and good. And then knight a, uh, knight a5 there um, is in my course, but I hadn't gotten to it, so from here I'm figuring it out on my own. Right, this looks very natural. This looks very natural to me as well. I mean, this just looks like it's over, right? It should have been. Yeah, I mean, I had it. So, okay, so it. this this is where black resigns, right? Like, next. Right. So, and that's not what happened. So now we need to investigate why, or rather what went wrong. So knight c3, perfect. I'm going to hide the moves. h6. Um, yep. Knight d5 makes any difference here, Daniel? Um. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> lucky I just said perfect. Um. Yeah. Knight d5. Yeah, I don't. Th I definitely didn't consider knight d5 in this position. Yeah. Um, my, once again, I'm going to quote my good friend Ramesh Daniel, and you heard it from me a myriad of times that the gut instinct every time in the club level's life is that if a piece is attacked, they are focused 102% on where to move it. My instinct yep. is that, no, I'm not moving that. You don't get to tell me what to do when I'm a piece up. Stuff you. You don't say any of this. <laughs> but it's just to yeah. demonstrate the point that you really want to be that cocky dude who wants to turn everything upside down. H night hanging? Pfft. Okay, cool. I'm not moving it. And I'm not even saying that necessarily this is, you know, the best move in the position, but I have to admit, the more I look at it, the more I like it, because after queen d6, I'm still flexing said muscles mm -hmm. about not moving the queen. And now both of these moves, by the way, are dropping the queen. Yep. Which, by the way, is a masterful, and I'm not referring to what I'm doing, but to what's happening on the board, presentation of the extra uh, the power of the extra piece that you have. The knight, yeah. by virtue of not moving back, is cutting out important squares from the queen. And now I'm actually forced to go here. And even here, instead of coming back, you can actually insert a trade. <laughs> Which is super, nece not necessary, but super cool. Because you're a piece up, so you want trades, right? Now, nothing yep. wrong with knight f3. This is not why I lost the game. But um, I just have to 
respect, uh, respond to the mentality. Uh, why are we not playing d5 here, Daniel? Yeah, I made a mistake in visualization. So well, my first concern was with d5 was, um, okay, so I I forgot that when I play d5, my queen guards uh, g4. Um, and so I thought, oh, well, if I play, I play d5, bishop g4, and I gave him that, I opened up the diagonal for the dark squared bishop, and then I have to um, maybe move the knight. So I forgot that he can't play bishop g4. Yeah, this is, Daniel, insane. the type of stuff that I feel powerless as a coach. So if you have got any ideas about how I can teach this better, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> I, I Honestly, I feel like I'm sitting here, I don't know what to say. Like I, yeah. could, the, the only thing I could tell you is that, dude, really, like I was blundering. But see, it's not productive. But I just don't know how to train this. I yeah, honestly well, I am powerless to this. Hopefully, just um, more so practice will we'll get rid of it. I'm happy as a coach here to throw my hands in the air and say I don't know. I don't yeah. know a lot of things. Uh, I do know a lot of things in coaching. This is one of those things where I'm like, yeah, we need to I, somehow better visualize this. But I don't know how. I remember you saying that the sideways yes, movements I did are, say that. are yeah. So sideways that's an example are of it. Harder to to spot than yes. Uh, yeah, something with that. I don't know. Hopefully ones. it'll fade in time. Other problems I've had in the past have faded just through constant practice. So yep, hopefully yep. that's one of them. Yep. Okay. Um. Right. Bit cheap, but I will let this slide. Like this move tells me, it's so sad because this is an immediate admission that they had no idea why you played this. <laughs> right. Right. They didn't. So right. for all they know, they just lost another exchange. Now they didn't because of this fluke. But yeah. Th this is just one of those heartbreakers, and you go like, "Oh my god, really, dude?" And yep, yeah, really, yeah. That that's what happened. We just did that, as in they did. Um, okay. Yeah. So we played Queen C two which I'm less than excited about. So tell me, Daniel, he please, on what grounds did we choose queen to c2? Because there seemed to be an abundance of available squares for your queen. Hmm. Um, trying to remember what my criteria was for this i tell you daniel the criteria that should govern your thinking in such positions every time all the time which by the way was another way to find uh, knight d5 instead of knight f3 probably i haven't hammered it too hard you're like oh my god really what would that be that i haven't hammered home too hard but the ultimate rule that i have developed during my coaching daniel is the never ever ever go backwards never yeah now when you are a piece up that never is written a hundred million times more on the paper with capital letters. Okay. We are not going back, mate. It's illegal. From here on out, Daniel, every time in your chess life you want to go back, just tell yourself, don't do it. And the ridiculous <laughs> thing is that there are a lot of occasions in chess when you're going to need to go backwards. Right. And still, in terms of percentages, you are going to do an immensely great service to your chess if you go forward every single time and you are going to correct a lot more wrongs than wronging rights by, you know, not going back when needed. In general, by the way, when you are a piece up, that's a no brainer. So what I'm trying to say is, Daniel, why are we going here when we can go here? I guess I just thought there was more attacks on the queen there so i don't know like maybe something like bishop d5 which no that just takes yeah. us daniel to rule number two fine show me the line that proves it wrong right because we have agreed upon this on lesson one that we are not discarding moves and ideas based on vague ideas like it can be attacked yep it can so show me how okay so and yeah, as soon as you show me I will immediately get this off the list. And that's how you think too, right? Because I tell you right. why I'm pro going here, Daniel, because we have an existing threat here and I added a new one by creating a second pin. Yeah. And the third one and the fourth one and whatever. Yeah, you going back 
you are reducing the number of things you can hurt your opponent with. Me going e4, I'm increasing the number of things that I'm hurting them with. And remember that the golden rule is that on this level of chess and at another 500 rating points, pressure means blunders. I am putting mm. on pressure. Now I'm threatening this, I'm threatening this, I'm threatening this. And by the way, the only yep. way to attack the queen is to play f5, after which, by the way, I'm going to break my golden rule and go backwards. Because now we definitely do have a supremely painful pin because the bishop has become unguarded as far as the pawn is concerned. By the way, I could, yep. ha I could have gone forward and probably should. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it was... I was responding to... I mean, I was basing it off of threats that I thought were possible, but I didn't calculate. Yeah. Now... Once again, I want to hammer it real hard, Daniel. We don't go backwards. Having said that, yep. that's still not the reason why you lost this game. No, it's not. Yeah. Although I did feel, yeah, I did feel like it was I was weirdly n just not um, in the driver's seat even after I'd won a piece. I felt like I was reacting too much to my opponent. Well, I'm glad to... you're saying that, Daniel. But that's yeah. your doing, mate. Like yeah, it's, I know, it's I not know. like they are putting the pressure on you. That could be a case. Very often you win a piece. It's a very common phenomenon. And the uh, initiative swings over. Here hmm. it hasn't happened yet. But you are enabling it. That's I'm very glad you said that. Because that is exactly the situation that we want to prevent. And that's why here the concepts of never ever go backwards apply triply. Because you really don't want now that momentum swing to happen. Um, right. I don't know what you did here, Daniel, but my number one candidate here is an IT4. Yeah, so I look at this position, I go like, right, there is a pin here, I need to hit the iron while it's hot, knight e4 centralizes the knight, hits the target one more time. No brainer, let's go. Mm. Now, I wouldn't play my move, I wouldn't play this move after, you know, such a sloppy calculation that I just presented there, because that wasn't even a calculation. That was just the driving principles behind knight e4. My calculation would go like, after knight e4, bishop f5 looks like a pain in the bum because that's a pin, except that's a loose piece. And loose pieces, usually when they create pins, that's the recipe for disaster. Knight, f knight e4, bishop f5, knight f6, check. Pawn takes, queen f5, game over. <laughs> now, yep. I justified my move by at least one line. Yeah, then I look at, okay, so yep. what if the bishop comes from this side? Well, that's not a pin. So I'm not too worried. dc5, bishop e4, queen e4, bishop c5, rook a c1. The position has cleaned up. We traded a pair of pieces. They are still sitting in a pin. I'm winning. Done. Knight yep. e4. What are we doing instead? Could still work because we are going to create a pin. So I like your choice. Because that's actually more forcing than knight e4. So I'm definitely not going to critique this. My idea still is that after bishop c5, we go knight e4. Mm. So okay. essentially, we are on the same board here. Yeah, I missed the pin options. I was just trying to trade down. Yep, once again, we must recognize this, Daniel. You should have already seen this here, by the way. Yeah, I missed it. I missed the potential so for the, that the pin. that pin there yeah. is unmissable. I mean, file well, sorry, line moving pieces on the same file is always instant tactical recognition that there is stuff going on here. Okay, like that's just basic geometry that they are on the same file. So if I move something, this is gonna be something. You need to be aware of bishop f2, by the way, because they work both ways. You're right. Yeah. So there's no excuse for not seeing either one of them or the other or neither or both. Well, they, uh, optimally you see both, because then bishop f2 is met by either queen or rook f2, both of them successfully saving the day. Right. Yeah, so once again, we back it with calculation. Um, still, we're completely winning. Yeah, okay. Um, my thing with this, Daniel, is, is that it doesn't quite resolve the pin if I go here, right? You're still pinned. Right. Once again, not really a biggie. I would have probably played queen b2 just to get a heck out of the pin. Start pressuring this, getting ready for knight e4. But rook c1 is fine, so I don't want to look like I'm criticizing every single move you make. And I was about to tell you that we're likely transposing. Good. Um, what? Where did this come from, senor? 
Um, yeah, it's not a move I usually make <laughs> uh, in this kind of position. I don't remember what my thinking was there. I don't know why. Uh, I think it was um, just back rank mates. It wasn't about the bishop. I don't see any. Yeah, I mean, I just didn't want to... Yeah, I didn't want to have to worry about it as I move forward. Yeah, you you know me, Daniel, about this, right? Is the back ring made threatened? No, don't defend it. Because this this okay. leads to stories like I played he. Why? To secure my queen. Against what? Right. It's the exact same story. <laughs> like the 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 chances of either of them occurring at the moment are equal. Um yeah. and by the way, there is a time and space for that to be done. But mm -hmm. to this, uh, my response would be, are we done with development? No, we're not. So, bang, rookie one. Uh, likewise, knight d4 is a very good move here too, by the way, to start pressuring or creating threats against the bishop. And then you are going to do that. But h3 is still fine, by the way. This is, again, not the reason why we lost the game. So, let's just roll on. Yeah, I would have changed the order of these two moves, that's for sure. Um, but, okay. Queen f6, awkward pin again. Knight d2. We, we, bro we broke the rule at a good time, Daniel, about going backwards. That being said, just to once again contradict myself, why not knight d5? Yeah, I was looking at that right now. It, um, so actually, no, sorry, I'm going to take everything back I said. This is going backwards, unacceptable, forward. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's better, for sure. Yep. Goody. Oh boy, do we have knight d5 here? We don't bugger. Okay. I would have considered sticking with the queen because I like the incoming knight moves and then cleaning d5 for the rook, but let's just go. Yeah. So the difference, Daniel, is, is that if you take with the queen and either of these bishop moves hit, then you defend and attack at the same time. And this is becoming increasingly annoying for black. I see. But let's just go. Okay, okay. Is this not hanging, Daniel? Uh, let's see. I th yeah, yeah. I don't. I'm not sure why I missed that. What was my move here? Yeah, I don't know. I don't I've know got Daniel several problems with what we're seeing. So first of all, it is just a, a blunder, like a, a decisive blunder, because after Queen B7, Black can actually resign. Two. I usually am the guy, you know, who likes... Oh, actually, no, I know where you're going with this. You want to go knight f5, so I actually approve of that. Um, what I wanted to tell you, that even if this wasn't doable, I would have preferred to see rook c7. Yeah. With tremendous threats. But to be fair to you, knight d4, knight f5 is a quite powerful idea. Although after knight f5, que uh, bishop f5, knight f5, queen g5 is going to hit the knight and defend the mate. So I would like to go back to when it's hanging and it's free. Let's take it. Um, yeah. That was a big miss. That was a big miss. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Direction-wise, Daniel, where are we going here? Yeah, same Yeah, stage. so why don't we go here? Okay, this yep. hangs this. So that right. is actually a reasonable proposition that to, was... to not to give it up. That being said, I really want to now go all in on this attack with rook c7, knight g3. And by all in, that's actually not the right way to say because that indicates that I'm risking a lot. Whereas I would like to present it as none. But okay, let's say that that's the problem. Yeah, so let's say that you don't want to give it up. Mm -hmm. Currently, the pin is not a problem for you because neither of the knights are hanging. So why don't we just fix the pawns on white, which is optimal, remove it from hanging, optimal, and prepare for the invasion. Yeah. Because as you know, yeah. we can't stand the thought of going back. Okay, trade, trade, trade. Good, good, good. Did we lose this, Daniel, because of time shortage? 
Yeah, in part. I mean, I don't want to blame it only on that. I felt like I should see the simple Well, I'm just following the faster. game, and it seems to me that you're still winning, you're still winning, you're still winning. So it looks like we are headed for an inevitable disaster, which I can only see as uh, a uh, time issue. Yeah, I had, I think, about a minute or a little less on my clock uh, when I blundered. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, this looks just really good technique on your end. I would have liked to see he queen e4, Daniel, because defend and threaten. Mm. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much time you have left here, but um, yeah, that seems to be that seems to be here the the main. Two minutes issue. or less on these final moves. All right. So the good old going forward rule yeah. never gets old. I mean, yep. once again, Daniel, the mentality is that you can't possibly be defend defensive in terms of mindset when you have an extra piece. That sounds just, yeah, wrong in every possible way. Right. Yeah, and that's that's, that's when the yeah. blunder kicked in. So you need to be very careful with loose nights in these endgame scenarios. But yeah, like um, we had a, a completely winning position from get go till the very end it's really sucky that you lost this because you definitely I know. did not deserve to lose this game at all i know i, I mean even once i i won the night for a pawn in the beginning i was like that's it you yep. know just and close see, it Daniel, out. one of the greatest um skills on your level of chess is to convincingly and confidently convert these a hundred out of a hundred and yeah. we went through the law, the numerous options and the numerous occasions when we failed to actually turn on the heat on the opponent. Mm -hmm. Oopsies, that was me pressing the wrong button. And that's exactly, by the way, the crux in this skill. And that is to constantly just retain the pressure. Queen e4 here with d5, not going back. So we already found between you winning the piece and what's on the board, three occasions where you could have actually struck them real hard, real hard, name mm -hmm. it four, or rather name it four now, instant win, by the way, because everything mm -hmm. comes off after 94, he b6 only, and then trade, trade, well, actually, I, would, I don't even know if I would take with bishop or queen, what, probably this way, and just everything comes off. Yeah. So between move 20, Two and when did we win the piece? So between move fourteen or fifteen, actually, is your turn. Let's go from here. Move fifteen and twenty-two. That's seven moves. We in a space of seven moves, we missed four very powerful, actually far stronger alternatives than what was played. Mm -hmm. So there is a mentality, Daniel. Uh, that I would like to finish this lesson on uh, in club level players and that is that they look at it like oh okay I won a piece so now all I need to do is to trade down and then I will and I'm going to win and they actually yep. re relax and mm -hmm. they think less they calculate less even less than before thinking that this is in the bag where the correct approach now is that I'm gonna hit you even harder now because mm. this is where I need to put this game away and from here on out, every extra move that I have to make is A, a burden, and two, an opportunity for the opponent to somehow crawl back into this game. So this is yep. now the time to put pedal to the metal. Mm -hmm. Like, this is where the real killing instinct needs to kick in. Yeah, and I didn't have that. And, and that, I, yeah. I mean, the, the good news is that's really insightful for me because I couldn't fully understand why I wasn't able to convert this. But lacking that mentality i can see how that was a big part of it now yeah it's the killing instinct not there daniel and that's i told you this many times the chess in this regard is incredibly brutal far more so than yeah the vast majority of sports because you know in using any ball game analogy you have the advantage you're just sitting on it until the whistle goes and then we won <laughs> yeah right. it doesn't work yep. like that right no, you, right. you really need to yeah exploit you now the benefits you have and go for the kale yeah, yeah, and the 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 forwards not backwards is really going to get in my head now. Oh, sh I, yeah. I've I've done it less. I've like moved backwards a lot less often in my games, but it's still like I'm going to make it like you said the golden rule from here on out. Yeah, good. Right. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I just looked at uh, the recording. Now I messed up at one point in the screen and it's frozen. But I don't care. Oh, no. the, the lesson was great, and uh, in my yeah. opinion, at least, and uh, the 
uh, the audio is what really matters. But I'm going to stop the recording now just to cut it off.